Our lakes as we know it are not safe as you'd like to think. Today's video is all about terrifying things that live and dwell in the lakes we all know and love. We like to think that the age of exploration ended long ago, that we know every square inch of our planet, while we do have a better idea of the Earth's topography than in centuries past, this is a little more than a quaint notion meant to quiet our minds when faced with the staggering implications of our reality. One scientific paradox, rarely ever discussed, illustrates how small we truly are and how little we actually know. Despite our best efforts, despite advanced technology like satellite imagery, it is widely accepted that something as simple as accurately measuring a coastline is impossible. Yeah, you can provide a general idea, but it is always a compromise. Let me explain. Coastlines are fractals. Beaches are straightforward enough, but harbors have inlets. Inlets have coves, and coves have dozens of minuscule nooks and crannies. These tiny passages continue to multiply as one zooms in, rendering any accurate measurement literally impossible by any conventional standard. There are always tiny little crevices going millimeters inland, then doubling back on themselves. This means that even smaller bodies of water, like lakes, have literally immeasurable coastlines. It's truly a mind-bending concept. If something as straightforward as measuring a coastline is unattainable, what other facts of reality elude our grasp? What else do we simply do not know? Most of us believe that lakes are safe to swim in, at least, compared to the ocean. Yes, depending on where you are, you have to watch out for alligators or crocodiles or water moccasins, hippos or snakes, etc. But compared to the vast dangers of the ocean, lakes seem almost quaint. But if myths and legends have any basis in reality, a whole host of unseen terrors might dwell in our inland waterways. Creatures that simply have no business existing at all. You might remember in our video on sea monsters that we utilized the categories proposed by researchers Lauren Coleman and Patrick Woosh. Since many of those cryptids appear equally often in fresh waters, we'll be using that same framework to explore the types of cryptids found within inland waterways. But before we start, it might be worth looking at some of the observations that cryptozoologists have made over the years regarding lake monsters. One of the most interesting trends is that many, not all, but many of the bodies of water said to harbor monsters appear roughly along the same latitude. Lake monster stories are exceptionally common in the United States, Canada, Ireland, the British Isles, Scandinavia, Siberia, France, Italy, the Czech Republic, and Southern Slavic countries. It's not a compelling trend, if not a hard and fast rule. This revelation led to late cryptozoologist Ivan T. Sanderson to coin the term monster latitudes. This is where lakes with monsters seem to proliferate. Exactly what this means is anyone's guess. Perhaps this region is simply a more hospitable environment for the creatures if they are indeed physical. The work of French folklorist Michel Merger seems to suggest that, at least sometimes, something supernatural is at work in the lakes where monsters dwell. In his excellent book, Lake Monster Traditions, Merger compiled a list of criteria noted across his work. Lakes with all monsters tend to experience an unusual amount of electrical storms. They usually have depths that are either immeasurable or rumored to be immeasurable as well as submerged cavern systems. These lakes also exhibit a rich history of drowning deaths, often where the bodies are never recovered. Interesting. Lakes said to house monsters also have a tendency to generate whirlpools and, most bizarrely, see reports of anomalous lights, both above and within the water. Like the monster latitudes, exactly what Merger's discovery reveals still remains unclear. But it does suggest that, at least in some cases, we might be dealing with something supernatural rather than cryptozoological in that naturalistic sense. 
while snake-like cryptids are a little more rare in lakes than in the ocean, there are still plenty to choose from. Many lake monsters are described using serpentine words, even if they have appendages. If we apply the term lake serpents loosely, we can find a good example in the Altamahaha or Alti, the monster that supposedly resides in South Georgia's Altamaha River. Long before settlers arrived, the Tama tribe told tales of enormous, sleek serpents that patrolled the river. According to them, it was a gigantic snake that hissed and bellowed loudly. The tribes even warned colonists about the creature, but few paid attention. To this day, Altamaha remains a source of ridicule, hence the extra ha to its name. But there are too many stories to laugh at. According to some, the creature has been sighted upwards of 350 times in the river and its accompanying wetlands. One of the earliest encounters by outsiders comes from 1830, when a Captain Delano of the Schooner Eagle allegedly saw a large serpent in the Altamaha River. According to a local paper, the captain saw a creature around 70 feet long. It held an alligator-like head eight feet above the lazy waters of the Altamaha River. Even at this early date, skeptics jumped to the conclusion that the captain had seen a whale that had somehow wandered up river. Despite how little his description sounded like a whale, supposedly this was not Captain Delano's only sighting. Sometime in the 20s, a large snake-like creature had frightened timbermen as they traveled along the river. Another account 15 years later said that several hunters had watched this gigantic snake twisting through the Altamaha River, as did Boy Scout troops in the 1940s. Everyone who sees Alti agrees that it is no ordinary snake. It is much too large. Even if it were, other aspects of the creature's anatomy don't appear especially snake-like. This is exactly what Donnie Manning noticed in his sighting, which occurred in either 1969 or 1970. While he isn't sure the exact year, Manning remembers that it was summer and that he and his brother were night fishing near Clark's Bluff in Darien, Georgia. They were casting their lines from their father's houseboat, the light from inside casting a perimeter of illumination on the slowly moving current below. The light barely reached far enough upstream to highlight the last remnants of some rougher moving rapids. Nothing too dramatic, but turbulent enough for South Georgia. Donnie and his brother, now adults, were looking for catfish. They were well on their way to a beautiful and bountiful haul, but Donnie was greedy for just a little bit more. He decided to try an old trick he had used in his youth, taking oatmeal and chewing tobacco as bait. In a matter of seconds, something tugged on the line, then bit in. But Donnie knew something was wrong. Catfish typically grabbed the bait and briefly fled before stopping, turning, and setting the hook. This, on the other hand, had snatched the bait, set the hook, and taken off right away. The thing surfaced just barely with the circle of light thrown off by the houseboat. It was about 10 to 12 feet long, and Donnie initially thought that he had caught a sturgeon, until he and his brother took a closer look. Whatever it was, it had an alligator-like snout that almost brought to mind the profile of a platypus. However, it was much too large, and this was in Australia. As the brothers studied the specimen, they discerned a ridge of triangular spine or bones running along its back. The entire thing was a dark gray, and they caught a glimpse of a white belly. The tail was oriented horizontally, like a mammal's tail, not vertical like a fish's. Most unsettingly, rows of knife-like teeth glinted in the light. The creature then bolted, bobbing up and down through the river like a dolphin might swim despite using a heavy saltwater rig. That night, Donnie's line snapped. Alti put in another appearance that decade. Benny Corsi, who grew up on the banks of the river, remembered a lazy Sunday afternoon in the early 1970s that he and his buddy had spent drinking and fishing. They were coming into dock for the day when an immense snake reared out of the water, tracing a collision course for their boat. At the last minute, the figure sank into the water, only to emerge on the opposite side about 20 yards away. 
It continued along its merry way, head raised high above the water, before disappearing around the river bend. Encounters continued through the 1980s and the 1990s, including another sighting by two motorists who saw the creature sunning itself on a cove in the river. Its skin was dark brown or black, and while 20 feet of its length was visible on the river bank, the rest of its body continued beneath the water. It appeared to be three to four feet thick. The creature thrashed violently to roll itself back into the river, then disappeared. As with other aquatic cryptids, marine mammals are surely to blame for at least some of the Alti sightings. The Altamaha River sees its share of dolphins and manatees. Yet, many witnesses familiar with these visitors adamantly maintain that the creature they have seen is far too thin to be a marine mammal. There are also alligators in the river, but locals rule these out as well. Such was the case with Harvey Blackman who remembered seeing something peculiar in the water by two-way fish camp in the 1980s. It was not a manatee or an alligator or a sturgeon, he said, of the creature that he and two friends saw from the floating dock. I know what all of them look like. This thing raised its head up out of the water and it looked like a snake head. The thing seemed around 20 feet long, as big around as a full grown man's body with slick gray brown skin. It left a wake that shook all the docked boats. Others up on the land did not see the creature, but did see the wake it caused. Alti put its appearance to this day. Some folks only hear it splashing, while others claim to see it once a year or so. Alti may have just had a cousin of sorts, just a little way to the south. Florida's St. John's River starts at a marsh in Indian River County, spilling into Lake George before winding its way past Orlando. It is home to the St. John's River Monster, or more adorably, Pinky. Paper articles as early as 1888 mention the presence of a large snake in the Caloosahatchee River, far to the southwest corner of the state. Pinky, on the other hand, seems to be a relative newcomer to Florida. In the 1960s, the American interstate system was brand new, allowing for a massive influx of tourists to the Sunshine State. And soon, motorists crossing the river began reporting something strange in the St. John's. Some said it looked like a dinosaur. Knowing how the Florida Everglades are, I wouldn't be surprised. Others said it looked like an oversized pink manatee or even a manatee with a pink tail and head, earning it the nickname Pinky. A pair of fishermen even claimed that the creature almost overturned their boat. There are hints here and there that Pinky may have wandered the waterways long before the 1960s, however. A guide for the early explorer, William Bartram, warned him around 1774 to beware the beast of the deep as they navigated the river. Lake Monroe, another body of water in the St. John's chain, saw reports of a massive creature darting underneath boats and even capsizing them on at least one occasion. Still. Most Pinky reports were confined to a brief period of time between 1955 and 1975. In the 1960s, Mary Lou Richardson famously saw Pinky while bow hunting with her father and a friend along the river. She brought the monster to their attention and all three agreed it looked unnatural, a somewhat long necked topped with a large flat head. It reappeared later that same day at the same spot to four other groups of people. All their descriptions generally agreed. Pinky had reappeared for at least one last time on May 10th, 1975 to a boat ferrying five people down the St. John's River right near Jacksonville. Everyone aboard said that they had watched as something resembling a dragon raised its head above the water only 20 feet away. The best descriptions of the monster came from witnesses Dorothy Abram, who said that it looked like a dinosaur whose skin was so tight every bone in its body could be discerned. The skin itself was the color of a boiled shrimp, while the head sported a pair of flapping gills and horns coiled like a snail's shell. Its eyes, which were slanted, were dark, almost black, and its mouth was turned downward in a frown. Pinky nonchalantly glanced at the people, it then suddenly disappeared just as suddenly as it had arisen, and was rarely resurfaced since. Water horses seem much more mammalian than their serpentine counterparts. 
While still possessing flippers and long necks, their heads resemble those of horses, often displaying manes, ears, or even horns. Some of the most infamous cryptid celebrities seem to be the water horses like Nessie in the Loch Ness, Champ in Lake Champlain, and Ogopogo in the Okanagan Lake. Since these fellas get all the press and are worthy of their own videos in the future, we'll shed some light on lesser known water horses. In the 1950s and 1960s, lake monster sightings began popping up in the Soviet Union. Many of these encounters occurred in and around Siberian lakes, where dogs had a reputation of mysteriously disappearing. In July of 1953, a state geologist and his companions allegedly observed massive creatures of 30 feet or more in one of these far northern lakes. After crossing hundreds of miles of swamp tundra, geologists led by G. Rukosiev set up camp on their banks of Lake Kier in 1964. Their goal was to study geothermal activity in the area, a feature which kept the lake warmer than other bodies of water in the region. According to Rokosoyev, members of his team actually saw a water horse in Lake Kier. Their first encounter had only one eyewitness. It was early morning and the creature had beached itself on the banks of the lake to graze on grass by the shoreline. According to the witness's description, the lake monster was bluish black. It had a long, thin neck and a tiny head. A dorsal fin adorned its back. The witness rushed back to fetch his companions, but by the time they arrived, the beast was nowhere to be found. However, they were able to make out depressions in the grass. Other members of the team later claimed similar sightings. Rukosiev said that his men were looking across the lake when suddenly the head appeared out in the middle of the expanse of the water and then the dorsal fin. The monster was lashing the water with its long tail, sending waves all over the lake. This particular series of sighting has become controversial over recent years. Some deem it an outright hoax. More reputably, in southeastern Norway, a large lake known as Rumzuin has seen monster reports since the 1700s. The creature is said to resemble a log with the head of a calf. It has caused quite a few high-profile sightings over the centuries, including a September 20th, 1976 event where a black cylindrical, almost sludge-like creature was seen by three adults and an entire bus full of children. Estimated lengths ran from 9 to 33 feet in length. In July of 1992, the creature appeared to a family of three during a stay at their vacation home. After returning from her morning swim, the mother looks out the window, only to see something in the waves. It was no more than 50 feet from the shore and appeared to be five feet long, maybe a foot wide. Part of it could be seen just a few inches above the water. She called to her husband and daughter, all of whom offered suggestions for what it could be ranging from a crocodile to a sea serpent. While the mother felt she could only see its back, she agreed that it appeared vaguely like that of an alligator or a crocodile. What a crocodilian would be doing in a Norwegian lake or how it could survive there remains inexplicable. Given the tendency for lake cryptids to congregate around monster latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, the appearance of lake monsters in Argentina comes as a bit of a surprise but something has long been reported in and around Lake Nawawapi, along the country's border, a 300 square mile body of water at the foot of the Patagonian mountains. This resident, called by locals Nawalito, is said to have rough skin and fins so large they almost look like an immense cloak. One witness, the head of a local environmental and conservancy society, claimed to have seen Nawalito in 1991, from the safety of a bus. He and the other passengers thought at first that it was a ship on the lake, but soon realized it was the infamous lake monster after the dark shape disappeared underwater. In the summer of 94, a pair of women were relaxing on the lake's beach when they noticed something crossing the glassy still waters. It was big, easily the size of a whale, evident from the many humps that trailed behind it. This was actually first of three sightings for one of the witnesses. Two years later, Jessica Campbell saw Naholito twice on the same day, 
The first time, she spotted two small flippers attached to a large shape in the lake that she could actually see breathing. She panicked, fled to a large rock along the beach. It was 45 minutes later and she had finally calmed down when without warning, the dark shape appeared once more swimming in her direction. She ran away as quickly as her legs would carry her. When we swim in fresh water, very few of us worry about shark attacks. Ignorance is bliss, I guess, because shark attacks indeed happen in lakes and rivers from time to time. Bull sharks famously travel upstream into fresh water, sometimes appearing well beyond where they would be expected. For example, in the United States alone, these sharks have been found as far inland as Illinois, about 700 miles from where they entered the river at the mouth of the Mississippi. You might want to wear a brown bathing suit in case you see one. White bull sharks aren't cryptids, giant sharks certainly are, and it's even stranger when they appear in fresh water. Yet for years, a beast has been said to cruise the waters of Alaska's Iliamna Lake. Iliamna Lake is actually the seventh largest freshwater lake on the entire planet. Long before settlers arrived, this monster was known to the local Inuit population who passed along warnings of the creature. One of the most dramatic sightings occurred in September of 1942. Pilot Babe Allsworth was flying Bill Hammersly over Ilmna Lake when the pair spotted something peculiar in the waters near one of the islands. Allsworth shouted, Oh my God, what a big fish! There was not one, but rather several dozens of the animals, dull aluminum in color with broad, blunt heads. Their tails moved side to side, ruling out the possibility that the witnesses were observing mammals. Owlsworth and Hammersleigh initially thought each fish was 10 feet long. As they descended to 300 feet, however, they could tell each one was longer than a seaplane's pontoons. After a few moments, the school of fish became agitated and dove. They disappeared, even though the water in the area was only about 40 feet deep. Whatever they were, they didn't appear to be sturgeons. The closest thing they resembled were sharks, although they seemed far too massive. A subsequent effort to catch the creatures proved semi-successful. Hammersley joined the monster hunters in their search effort. They fixed a chunk of moose flesh to a gigantic hook. The hook had been fashioned from a foot-long iron rod, quarter inch thick, using 16-inch stainless steel aircraft cable this hook was attached to a 55-gallon oil drum, which served as a massive bobber. The good news, something took the bait, and the bad news is it snapped the line in two. Gigantic turtles represent another oversized animal that simply shouldn't exist. While turtles with 15-foot shells can be found in the fossil record, nothing today comes close, nothing officially recognized, that is, the truth of the matter is that people sometimes see turtles that dwarf their prehistoric predecessors. According to a local family, a family of four moved to the Florida town of Punta Gorda during the early Great Depression, where they hoped to start a new life as fishermen. However, tragedy struck on August 30th, 1932, when a hurricane made landfall while the family was out fishing. Hurrying home, they barely made it to the safety of what is now Charlotte Harbor Preserve State Park, where just a little bit of dry land could be found amidst the rising floodwaters. The family began wandering the high ground, gathering as many shellfish as they could to pass the time until the waters receded. As they did so, the family's young daughter spotted what she believed was a treasure chest, maybe a lost pirate relic. To their dismay, the chest was filled with nothing but old cannonballs. It was too late, however. In their excitement, the family had been distracted. The flood was not going out. It was coming in. The water rose rapidly, and all four family members waded through the murky current, desperately seeking higher ground. At last, the daughter spotted what she believed was an old Indian mound. It just might be high enough to keep them safe. Everyone clamored to their new refuge and collapsed atop the small hill, clinging to a small tree at the top. There, they sat wondering if this spot would be tall but to repel the flood. The waters continued rising, and things were not looking good. Then, without warning, the entire mound lurched forward. 
what was actually happening. Were they actually on an old dirt covered boat dislodged by the flood? Was there some sort of landslide? The family's son leaned over the edge of the hill to peer into the water. To his surprise, the large, lolling eye of a gigantic turtle stared back at him, then blinked lazily. They had found their safety on the back of an enormous shell. The entire family literally rode out the hurricane on the back of a reptile, which always stayed at the surface no matter how deep the waters became. Eventually, the flood abated enough for the family to return home, and the turtle had saved their life. Obviously, the giant turtle of Punta Gorda may just be a tall tale, but some modern sightings are much more legitimate. One of the most famous giant turtles is the lake monster from the Churubusco, Indiana, dubbed Oscar the Beast of Busco. For 80 years, people have seen this massive turtle in Folk Lake, and countless hunters have found themselves frustrated by how elusive the creature remains. Rumor has it that Oscar is the size of a dining room table and might weigh as much as a quarter of a ton. Oscar may or may not be real, but there is no doubt about the existence of another massive turtle once regarded as a living legend. According to an old myth, Won Kim Lake in Vietnam was once home to a gigantic turtle who aided the Emperor Lele in 1418. The Emperor had called to the heavens for aid in repelling Chinese invaders and was answered with a gigantic turtle who gifted him a magical golden sword. The turtle then took the sword back into the lake, giving the body of water its name, Lake of the Returned Sword. And for centuries, the turtle was regarded as a complete fantasy. After centuries of speculation, a specimen of this mythical beast was finally found in 1967. Tragically, it was accidentally killed during its capture, leading some to wonder if the last turtle had died in that lake. Then, in 1998, indisputable video of another Huan Kim turtle emerged. At least one of the creatures had survived. And some debate exists as to whether the Wan Kim turtle is an existing species or a new type of soft shell turtle altogether. Either way, its existence successfully made the transition from legend to fact. As technology progressed over the years, the turtle was even caught on drone footage. Sadly, the Wan Kim turtle was found dead in January of 2016. Its body, which measured 6'3", has since been preserved and placed on display in the Temple of the Jade Mountain, which sits exactly on the island in the middle of the lake. One can only hope that since the turtles remained hidden for so long, a population still dwells somewhere within the lake. The concept is silly, I mean, giant beavers, really. But for tribes in Utah, it was never a laughing matter. To the Pocumtuck tribe, who lives in modern Deerfield, Massachusetts, the giant beaver was a thing to be feared. It would come ashore time to time out of Lake Hitchcock to ravage villages and eat members of the tribe. Similar beliefs in gigantic beavers can be found among the tribes in the Pacific Northwest or the PNW. But what about modern sightings? Utah is ground zero for giant beavers. According to the Shoshone, a giant beaver was spotted in the Utah's Bear Lake following the Great Snowstorm of 1830. After that, settlers in the vicinity would come face to face with giant beavers throughout the later half of the 19th century. In July of 1860, S.M. Johnson saw what he initially believed to be a corpse floating in Bear Lake. Upon closer inspection, he realized it was a beaver's head, but three feet tall. Two weeks later, the creature appeared again in the lake with six smaller ones in tow. Ten witnesses, all of unimpeachable character, all claimed to see the same thing, which was estimated around 40 feet long. That's a massive beaver. This gigantic beaver, now called the Bear Lake Monster, appeared off and on throughout the 1860s, eventually appearing to famous Mormon pioneer William Budge on May 15, 1874. Budge was only 20 yards from the shoreline when he saw an immense beaver playing in the water. Its face was flat, with large eyes and prominent ears, but at the same time resembled a fox's face. 
Over the years, descriptions of the bear lake monster have grown to include attributes from alligators, snakes, dogs, and otters. But Bear Lake isn't the only place to see such creatures. They're all over the state. A sighting in 2000 in Lake Powell found a Miss J. Greenwald describing the creature as more prehistoric than today's North American beavers. She said her beaver was the size of a horse and covered in soaking wet, thick brown black hair. Notably, Mrs. Greenwald filed this report with the National Institute of Discovery Science, or NIDS, the same organization that investigated Utah Skinwalker Ranch. As luck would have it, individuals associated with the NIDS would have had their own giant beaver sighting at the Sherman Ranch property. The 2021 book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, tells how a cone of silence descended during one of the late night vigils held at Skinwalker Ranch. Not only were the distant dogs and night insects suddenly quiet, but even the wind stopped, a phenomenon first noted by UFOologist Jenny Randalls, who called it the Oz Factor. And to this eerie scene shuffled a strange creature, about as large as a 150 pound pig, even its clumsy walk through the underbrush failed to break the silence. As the team members stared, they began to make out more details. A row of dinosaur-like spines bordered its back, and it drug a large flat tail behind it, comparable to that of a giant beaver. The witnesses watched the creature pass out of sight before snapping out of their stunned silence. When they leapt into action to look where the creature should have been, nothing could be seen. It had simply vanished into thin air. Like so many other cryptids, giant beavers are rooted in the fossil record. Bones identified as belonging to a gigantic beaver named Castorides were found in 1837 in a peat swamp near Nashport, Ohio. Since then, other remains have been found, almost always in regions whose tribal legends speak of giant beavers. These details not only corroborate indigenous lore, but reframe modern descriptions of giant beavers as prehistoric in a fascinating new light. The world's largest octopus species is the giant Pacific octopus. Only rarely does it exceed 20 feet. One controversial claim cites a specimen with a 30-foot arm span, but if this is accurate, this has to be an outlier. That is, unless something bigger lurks in the depths of the sea. Stories from sailors tell of octopi with arms stretching 75 feet or longer. Old Norse myths about the kraken may have been inspired by giant squids or immense octopi. But even these colossal denizens of the deep pale in comparison to the beast of folklore, which was often mistaken for an island. If truly gigantic octopi are out there, it seems easy enough to not run into one. Just stay out of the water, right? No. Unfortunately for those who fear underwater creepy crawlies, there are actually a few reasons to suspect that freshwater octopi, often frighteningly large, might be real. The limestone bedrock of the Bahamas is pockmarked by aquatic caverns and sinkholes called blue holes, which are filled with a combination of salt and fresh water. Within these ominous portals lurks the Lusca, if local legends as to be believed. It is variously described as a giant octopus, a giant cuttlefish, a half shark, half octopus, or a horrifying combination of a dragon and an octopus. Somebody call Cthulhu. Luska is stealing your shtick. But in 1997, journalist Randy Wayne White wished to go swimming in one of the blue holes. But locals quickly advised against doing so. One of them claimed to have seen an immense ridge-like shape rise from the water and drag an entire horse carcass into a blue hole. Television programs have featured more recent Luska witnesses. In 2009, Fisherman Peter Douglas told Josh Gates of his sighting in a blue hole on Andros. I was down in the ocean blue hole, and as I checked it out, just came up off the bottom, and it was mainly a murkyish, grayish, brownish color. Then, behind it, I saw a couple of tentacles rise above the bottom as I slowly turned around and went back in. It's at least 40, 50 feet. It's huge. Closer to home for us Americans, 
The Oklahoma octopus is a long-standing urban legend which simply refuses to die. Said to inhabit any number of lakes, Lake Thunderbird, Uliga, and Lake Tenkiller are common haunts. The creature is believed to stealthily pick off unsuspecting swimmers one by one. There are few, if any, reputable sightings. Believers typically point to the high incidence of drownings in these lakes, but no victims have ever shown sucker marks on their bodies. Only in 2017 did the slightest glimmer of evidence emerge for an Oklahoma octopus. On August 9th, officials confirmed that a swimmer actually found an octopus in Grand Lake. Skeptics immediately jumped into action, claiming everything from escaped pets to a practical joke. They said that a prankster had gone to the buffet at the Yacht Club and tossed the octopus into the lake. But no matter what explanations they offer, one question still lingers. What if it was a baby? But more importantly than that, what do you guys think? Let me know what you think down in the comments below. I want to hear your guys' opinions and thoughts on today's episode. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll see you guys in the very next episode. Watch out for those giant beavers.